All right. Average FPS is the most common measurement of gaming performance that I see across YouTube and websites. As someone who upgraded to a 5600X from an i5-4690K, I found that frame time consistency is much more important in gaming than the volume of frames being churned out. What would you, uh, would you look into using frame time graphs in the future? Interesting question here. I'm not I'm not really sure where these sort of misconceptions stem from exactly, but like the Core i5-4690K, that, that's not a fast CPU. Like, <laughs> I mean, the average frame rates alone on that thing will not be good. <laughs> uh, it, it's not churning out max FPS by a long shot. That is a very slow CPU by today's standards. The 5600X is almost infinitely faster in comparison. It is so much more powerful. It's just not even funny. So I am not surprised that you've noticed an improvement in your gaming performance. As for the average FPS is the most common measurement of gaming performance that I see across YouTube and websites, like we and many others include 1% lows and they are a very accurate and clear indicator of issues resulting in frame time inconsistencies. Like, if you're going to see any kind of stuttering, that will certainly show up in the 1% lows. And we have a ton of evidence for that. Like if I test your Core i5-4690K, which you can look at, we've got graphs in our day one reviews that include the Core i5-7600K and the frame time consistency for games like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, as an example, are horrific. The 1% lows are like half that of a part like the 5600X, probably even lower. So you can clearly see where those frame time inconsistencies are within our graphs. So I don't know why a lot of people are like, you know, average FPS, you, you can't tell about, it's like, yeah, guys, we have 1% lows. Like, have a look at those. They, they tell you what you yeah. need to know. Um, I think as for the, the frame time graphs, sorry, Tim, I'll just- Yeah, go for it. Bit. As for the frame time graphs, I am not a fan of frame time graphs. Like. For a for science type video, having a look at those, analyzing those for individual CPUs, yeah, can be maybe interesting. No, uh, uh, dubious to how valu uh, valuable they are because they're just so difficult to read. Uh, overlaying them with other CPUs just becomes this mess. You can't really tell what's what. And frankly, it's visualized just so much better in a bar graph showing 0.1% yeah. lows, 1% lows. I, I don't know what this insistence is on this being a more technical, more thorough way of showing the data because it just simply isn't. It, it just it just is not. I don't know why uh, some people like to insist that it is. And in a lot of instances, we are playing these games to get you guys the data. Most of the games don't have a built-in benchmark. And in a lot of instances where they do, we don't use the built-in benchmark, such as Shadow of the Tomb Raider, for example. We do not use the built-in benchmark for testing CPUs, period. We use a village section of the game, which is very CPU heavy, heavily, uh, very CPU demanding, much, much more so than the built-in benchmark. So, I mean, yeah, if you watch any of our reviews, you will know the 5600 XT is significantly better than a Haswell-based Core i5 for quite literally every performance metric. So sorry, Tim, yeah. I'll, I could keep going, but I'll let you talk. I think it comes down to people not really understanding. Well, I think some people understand what the 1% low is, but beyond that, mm -hmm. not knowing how to read a bar graph that's got average and 1% lows on it. It's not just mm -hmm. about measuring 1% lows from one CPU versus another CPU. It's about the difference between the 1% low and the average frame rate for the same processor. If you've got a- Relative to other rel parts. Yeah, so Sorry. if you've got a mm -hmm. CPU where the 1% the low is very close to the average, that means that on mm -hmm. average, you're getting a good frame rate and 99% of the time, your frame rate is gonna be above the 1% low. So if those two numbers are close, you're getting very consistent performance because the average and mm -hmm. the 99th percentile are basically the same. Then if you've got another CPU where you've got an average that's quite high, but a 1% low that's quite low, then the difference between that average and the sort of minimum-ish performance that you're getting is large. So there's less consistency, and that is showing you exactly what you're saying in this question about frame time consistency. If those two numbers are far apart, frame time consistency is worse and that always shows itself in these graphs. And again, if you show 0.1% lows, which we don't usually do because it doesn't really show much more than the 1% lows do, but with those two metrics, you can perfectly see in those charts when you've got you know, close 
average of 1%, close average of 1% for two CPUs, then another CPU where the 1% loads a lot lower, that CPU is going to have frame time stuttering. It's going to have inconsistent performance. Mm -hmm. And you can see that from the bar chart that you don't need to look at the frame time graph to get that information. So I think that le learning about the 1% lows in that way, learning how to read these charts is quite important. And I think a lot of people that you know, are asking for things like frame time graphs don't necessarily understand that, which again, you know, it's not immediately obvious on first glance. It's, it's much more obvious when you see a frame time graph and you can see that big spike and you can say, oh, that part stuttered. Whereas this is just a different interpretation of that data. The other issue that I have with um, frame time graphs, now I'll cut you off. Sorry. <laughs> That's fine. No, no, continue, continue, Tim. <laughs> the other issue I have with frame time graphs that you didn't mention was that mm -hmm. they are not an average of runs. So when you see... No, I was about to say that, yeah, yeah. When you, when you see a frame time graph, it's one run. So if you're comparing mm -hmm. one GPU to another GPU using frame time graphs, you don't know if those stutters that you're seeing, you know, those big spikes, whether that was just due to that run that was captured or whether that's true for all runs. Whereas when you average mm -hmm. together all the data and you average your 1% lows, it's still capturing any necessary spikes, but it's also doing that across multiple runs, which gives you more robust and accurate data, which is why personally, yes. I don't like showing the frame time graphs. I think they're hard to read for, for a start. If you've got two graphs that are yeah. like this and you've got another CPU that's like doing that just above it, very hard to read and see the margins. But I also don't like when they've, when you show footage, you know, one, one GPU running the game here on the left side and another GPU running another game on the other side, because again, you've run into the same issue. It's not a, it's a one run average of that game. Yes. So again, you, you yep. run into the same issues as showing frame time graphs. I know people prefer that sort of method where you see the FPS counter from one side and the FPS counter on the other side. But if the footage isn't lining up perfectly, if you're just doing a one run average, it, it doesn't give you that robust information that three run averages in bar charts do, which is why we tend to show them. Of course, Th those other techniques can have their place from time to time and you know it's a nice visual representation mm -hmm. at times and could be mm -hmm. useful but i don't think it's as useful and as immediately visually representing the data as the bar charts do but again we're bar chart fans so we're gonna we're gonna defend the bar charts to, till we die basically well not yeah i mean <laughs> I, I know you're just somewhat joking about that because look if we're going for what is the most accurate way of testing. Like, doesn't matter how difficult it is, we want to provide you guys with the most accurate information possible in the most easy to digest method possible. So if simply recording gameplay footage, which we do a lot of the time anyway, and showing that to you guys was the best way of achieving those goals, we would certainly do that. But as Tim talked about, there are a lot of shortcomings with that test method. Uh, mainly one of them being that there is no way of showing an average of three runs unless you show here's pass one, here's pass two, here's pass three, and here's the average of those results, which is you might as well just show a bar graph at that point. And that is not uh, an efficient way of conveying the information that you guys require. So we respect your time and we try to do all that background work so then you can watch the videos, get all the information you need in whatever it is, 15 minutes or whatever, and move on. But yeah, people who say that, you know, you should show gameplay because, you know, showing the, the, the frame pacing and all that is the best way to, be, it's just rubbish. It's not true. The best way is to benchmark a certain scene, 60 uh, seconds or whatever it is, find a demanding scene, test that three times and provide the average result because it can be so misleading doing one test pass. You know, what caused that frame stutter? Was it Steam decided to check for an update or any number of things, Windows doing something, exactly a virus right. scanner doing something. There's so many things that can cause that. And yeah, and again, you could say that, oh, but that, that stutter is constantly caused on a six core processor where it won't be seen on a 16 core processor. Maybe that's true. But again, that will be reflected to a degree in something like a 1% low. Hmm. But also I think there's too much emphasis on this whole like getting really anal about the whole, oh, did it spike there? Was that a spike? Because if you're buying a high-end gaming PC, you're spending $500 plus on your CPU, you're spending $1,000 on your GPU, you're buying you know, $400 worth of memory, all that kind of stuff, then yeah, I think you could justify being that sort of 
you know, on it with, you know, you, you want it to be as smooth as possible and no frame stuttering. And honestly, if you're buying a really high end rig, you should be achieving that anyway. But if we're talking about like a Core i5 10400F versus a Ryzen 7 5800X and you're like, oh, oh see that one stutter there? See the, the Core i5 does that one stutter. I don't care that it's like three times cheaper. It did that one stutter that you're probably not going to notice. So therefore get eight cores. You must have it. It's just, it's, I don't know, it just misses the point. Like if someone's getting something that's significantly cheaper and it may not be absolutely flawless, that's okay. It's kind of like what we talked about earlier with the 5700 XT. It wasn't the most well-polished and flawless product, at least upon release, but it offered you a great level of performance for a great price. So people were willing to sort of take the punt on it. And yeah, I think this emphasis on being just ridiculous about frame pacing misses the point in a lot of mm. you know, scenarios. Yeah, so. and really I think the most important thing is that when you see a frame chart, you don't there's you don't know, as you were saying, what is causing any of the issues that you're seeing in those charts. There's no mm. there's literally no way of knowing. So a lot of people interpret those spikes as being caused by the game. But as you said, it could be yep. a background process. And th there's literally no way of knowing. And it doesn't yeah. it doesn't matter that, you know, you might assume that it's one thing or the other. If if your assumption is wrong, then you're not getting accurate data, which is why it's very important to sort of do those three run averages and show it as an average because it removes those um, it removes the guesswork that you need to do with those charts. Even if you see two lines of you know frames going like that, and another one might dip down a bit. You don't know, for example, that the the footage at those two exact moments wasn't lining up. It could be mm -hmm. that one CPU is providing better performance than the other, or it could be that when you're benchmarking the game, that you know the footage shown in those exact moments was was different on the two processes, especially if you're not using a built-in benchmark. There's there's just no way of knowing, um, which again is why averaging the data together is more important, and I think why you see the majority of the work that we do and you know most review sites, you know Gamers Nexus and Antec use very similar methods. It's because it genuinely is one of the best ways of showing this sort of um, performance. And again, mm -hmm. the introduction of 1% lows as pioneered by good old Scott Wasson over at uh, Tech Report back in the day when he was doing a lot of this frame time work has really helped simplify that and mean that we don't need to rely on frame time graphs anymore. The 1% low does a great mm -hmm. job. 99th percentile, obviously, which is the same thing, shows you a great a great amount of data that is, is very helpful and simplifies it for you. Yep. But I think, uh, again, you were joking about it, but we aren't married to a certain method. So if another method came up tomorrow that was proven to be the best and we investigate it, it's like, yeah, look, this is a better way of accurately showing the user experience, we'd change like that. Like, yep. it, it's not a problem for us at all. You guys are going to, if we stop doing bar graphs and do another method and we make accurate recommendations that you guys uh, believe were accurate, then you guys are going to tune in. And that's the thing, like, a lot of the CPU recommendations and stuff we've made where we've seen, you know, parts stuttering and we've said this part stutters there, you guys have reported back. And I'm I'm not talking about a couple of people, anecdotal evidence from a few people. We're talking about thousands of people have been like, yeah, no, this CPU is no good in this game. And then when we've said this CPU is perfectly acceptable, thousands of you have reported back that, yeah, look, this works really well. So it's not like our recommendations or what we're seeing differs from the community at large. And, you know, we run a lot of polls on stuff like that. We're constantly getting your feedback uh, to find out if the test methods we're using and that stuff is accurately ref reflecting what you guys are finding in your gaming experience.